Hi, this is Pastor Daryl Myatt from Keller, Texas. Today is Monday, September 16th, 2019. This channel is all about world news, Bible prophecy, end time events, and the return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This is a rather disturbing headline to see out of end of the American dream. Headline says, the U.S. prepares to strike Iran as the Middle East braces for World War III to erupt. Wow! So over the weekend, there was quite a lot of activity. President Trump is using this phrase, locked and loaded, to describe our current stance toward Iran. Locked and loaded. That's referring to a gun having ammo in it, one in the chamber, ready to fire. Um, looks like some kind of U.S. military action could be imminent. Now, please don't misunderstand. I'm not hoping for war or pumping for war or promoting war. I'm not some kind of warmonger. Just telling you what's going on. The Bible speaks of war and rumors of wars and all kinds of things happening toward the end of man's reign on earth prior to the return of Christ. Um, I don't know if you've seen all that's been happening over the weekend, but there was an attack on Saudi oil production facilities. It was the worst one ever in history. And it seems pretty unlikely that the United States and Saudi Arabia are going to allow this to pass without some kind of response. Um, Trump's saying we're locked and loaded. Waiting to hear from the kingdom as to who they believe was the cause of this attack and under what terms we would proceed. Wow. Out of Yahoo, drone attack on Saudi oil fields seen as realizing worst fears. <clears throat> this drone strike that happened Saturday on the heart of Saudi Arabia's oil production facilities was the realization of their worst fears. We've already seen oil prices skyrocketing since this happened. Um, uh, here's an, another headline saying, Attack on Saudi oil field, a game changer in Gulf confrontation. It's a game changer. The attack on the world's largest oil processing plant early Saturday morning is a dramatic escalation in the confrontation between Iran and Saudi Arabia. Largest ever attack on Saudi Arabian oil. You know, I can't help but think of what it speaks of in Revelation in regard to the times of the end. Um, in Revelation 15, starting in verse 1, where he said, I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up with the wrath of God. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire. And them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. You know, I've always wondered what might happen if a nuclear bomb were dropped in an area that had oil and sand and water would it not become a sea of glass? Just curious. Um, out of the Jerusalem Post, Iranian media says attacks on Saudi Arabia means the world needs Iran's oil. Iran's press TV came out and said, hey, guess what? With uh, Saudi Arabia's oil not being functioning properly, now the world needs our oil. Hmm. Seems like they may have thought that one out a little too much. Willing to bet the blame goes on Iran. It was one of their drones I'm reading in other places. Who knows what will happen? I don't know. I do know how it ends, though. God wins. The devil's defeated. Christ reigns for a thousand years. <laughs> We're watching the other things come into play, though. Out of Israel, Hayom, Netanyahu approves new Jordan Valley settlement. 
says U.S. peace plan is imminent. Today is the 16th. Tomorrow. So tomorrow is the Israeli elections. 17th, right? Trump has said, yeah, I'm going to roll out my peace plan right after the elections. Could be this week we see this peace plan. We, I've already seen uh, where someone has kind of rolled out a map <clears throat> showing what Trump is going to do, what his peace plan looks like. And if this map is true, it doesn't it doesn't bode well. Um, as the map I saw was giving a lot of the West Bank to the Palestinians and just a few little places here and there within that area given to the Jewish people. We'll see soon enough. Um, hope and pray for Israel. Pray for peace in Jerusalem as the Bible tells us. Out of the Times of Israel, Netanyahu says, after Jordan Valley and settlements, I'll annex other vital areas. Oh, he's talking about the West Bank, beyond the Jordan Valley, major settlement blocks. He's talking Judea, Samaria. And again, I'm seeing this map of the West Bank that purports to show the final arrangement proposed by the Trump peace plan. And honestly, a lot of land given to the Palestinians. And you know what? I'm just, I'm not of the thought or the camp that believes we should give more land to the Palestinians. Land for peace hasn't worked yet. It won't work now. The Palestinians will just use that, just like they did Gaza. They'll just use it to build up military installations to come against Israel. And they'll be much better equipped to attack Israel. Should Israel have to give up more land? Just amazing watching these things happen. Out of the Times of Israel, Organization of Islamic Cooperation totally rejects Netanyahu's annexation vow. Well, of course they do. Because the 57 states and 22 Arab countries that surround Israel just want to wipe Israel out. Do you see what Ilhan Omar said out of the Washington Examiner? Omar said, Netanyahu's existence is contradictory to peace. Really? She's, she's pumping people not to vote for Benjamin Netanyahu, saying we need him gone. He's not helping anything. Hmm. This is a congresswoman in America's Congress. Very anti-Israel. Of course, she's also anti-American. Let's get into the word today. In John 4, verse 48, Then said Jesus unto him, Except you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. Except you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. You know, the Bible tells us that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus the same yesterday, today, and forever. But you know what's funny? Human nature really hasn't changed that much either since Jesus was here on earth. Human nature, sadly, is the same yesterday and today. It won't be forever, though. That's the good part. You know, back in Jesus' day, people wanted a sign. They wanted a miracle from Jesus. They wanted something tangible, something that they could see so they could believe in him, so they could know that he was who he said he was. Well, guess what? Today, people are just like that. They're the very same. People say, oh, I would believe in Jesus if only he'd show himself physically, if only he would make himself known to me, if only he would speak to me, if only he would come through miraculously somehow in their lives and show that, yes, he indeed is real and can be trusted. <laughs> it's easy to have faith in something you can see or hear or touch. That's easy. Hebrews 11.6 tells us without faith it's impossible to please God. When Jesus said, unless you see signs and wonders, you won't believe, he was saying, hey, don't wait for a sign to believe and trust in me. Don't wait for some kind of miracle from heaven. Don't demand that I perform for you in order for you to believe in me. It's not how it works. It's called faith. Have faith. 
you might be struggling to trust in Jesus Christ in your life today. But I want you to know that even though I don't know what you're going through, I don't know what mountains you're facing, I want to challenge you to trust Jesus. Even if you can't see him in your circumstances right now, even if you can't hear him answering your prayers, even if you can't feel him in your life, you know, Jesus had no confidence in the kind of faith that demands sight. Faith that demands sight is not real faith. It's just doubt expecting evidence, right? <laughs> it's doubt expecting evidence. And you have to understand something, too, that we just can't figure God out. The Bible tells us his thoughts and ways are so far and above us that we can't possibly understand. There will be times when you won't be able to see in the dark. There will be times when you have to just clinging, keep clinging, seeking after him, bringing your heart to God by faith. Maybe this is the kind of time in your life right now. And I understand it's, it's hard, I know. But Jesus wants you to get to that place in your life where it's not about the miracle, but it's all about him. I mean, where you're willing to trust him, no matter what the outcome, good, bad, ugly, whatever. So if you find yourself in a place where you need a miracle, look to Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint. Hebrews 12, verses 2 and 3. I hope this encourages you to trust Jesus Christ today, no matter what you're facing, no matter what you're going through, because he is trustworthy, he is faithful, he will never leave you nor forsake you, and he is coming back again. You ever read in the book of Haggai? That's the part of some people's Bible that the pages are kind of stuck together because they haven't been opened very much. In Haggai 1, um, Lord is saying, The time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet saying, It is time for you, O you, to dwell in your in your sealed houses and this house be waste. What do you pursue in life? What is it you're seeking? What are you after? What, what do you spend your time doing? You know, the answer isn't found in what you think your goal is, but in what you're actually doing. I mean, you may claim the Lord Jesus to have first place in your life, but are you actually pursuing him above all else? Or have you gotten sidetracked with your own desires? Now, don't misunderstand. Yes, we all have bills to pay. We all have to keep the lights on and, you know, the mortgage or the rent paid. I get that. These Jews, the Bible speaks of, who returned to the land of Israel after being in Babylonian ca captivity for so long, they had this goal of rebuilding Jerusalem and the temple. But they became distracted with construction of their own homes and they kept postponing the work on the Lord's house. So as a result, God was challenging their efforts. The Lord described it like this. He said, you look for much, but behold, it comes to little. When you bring it home, I blow it away. Haggai 1 verse 9. See, these People mistakenly thought that they could put their own financial interests ahead of God's and still prosper. You know, today they might say something to the effect of the faster I go, the behinder I get. You ever felt that way? Like a little mouse on that treadmill just spinning the wheel round and round and round, just wearing yourself out and for what? So you can get up and go do it again tomorrow, right? Right? Same kind of thing happened in Malachi's day. The people failed to bring their tithes and offerings. 
into the storehouse. God called it robbery. He admonished them to bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so he could open up the windows of heaven and pour forth abundant blessings upon them. Malachi 3 verse 10. There's a lot of Christians who say, oh, tithing, that's an Old Testament thing. That's not a New Testament thing. I disagree. Jesus, when he was talking to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, he said, you tithe mint and rue as you ought and you ought to do these other things. You know, Jesus is saying, yeah, you should tithe. That's a New Testament thing. Jesus saying, yeah, you should tithe. This principle reaches down to us today still. It covers more than just financial matters. I mean, Peter has given us a list of qualities that God wants us to diligently seek. If you look in 2 Peter 1, verses uh, 5 through 11. And besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacks these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Neglecting these things for other pursuits is short-sighted, but those who practice them will avoid stumbling. I think a lot of people, if we could just live the way God tells us to live in his word, would be doing so much better. I keep hearing people speaking about, oh, it's this life and that's it. Once we're done, we're dead, we're, it's over. There's nothing after this. I keep hearing people say that. I cringe when I hear it because I know Jesus taught differently. In Luke 16, 22, and it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. You know, this story very clearly teaches us there is life after death. It shows there's no kind of soul sleep where our souls are awaiting the resurrection of our bodies, but we go into a conscious eternity immediately. You draw your last breath on earth, you take your next breath in heaven or hell. There's only two destinations possible after death, heaven or hell. You either go to a place of torment for the wicked or a place of blessing for the righteous. There's no limbo. There's no purgatory. There's no second chance. It's final. Our eternal destiny, once we die, it's final. Abraham's bosom is a symbolic term designating a place of comfort for the righteous dead. In the heart of the earth, you know, the same region as hell where the ungodly go. The rich man's body was in the grave, and yet the scripture speaks of him lifting up his eyes and seeing Lazarus in Abraham's bosom. You know, I think our soul mirrors our physical shape so closely that it is recognizable. It's probable that one's soulish body is a very close image or duplicate of our physical body. Part of this man's torment was from the flames. But he was also tormented by the thoughts of his loved ones who were still living on earth and their eternal destiny. I mean, I'm sure his helplessness to warn them would have only made his misery worse, right? And he, he, was, he was begging, please, you know, send somebody back. Send somebody to tell them. And... He was in torment. 
And I'm sure the fact that he could see Lazarus and Abraham in a place of total blessing and comfort would probably keep him from ever adjusting to this torment situation, ever. Um, so here he was, lifted up his eyes, he saw Abraham. Abraham said, said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime received thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. Talked about this great gulf between them, this great chasm. Then he said, send, send someone to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. Isn't that interesting? And he said unto them, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. Isn't that funny? Because that's exactly what Jesus did. He did rise from the dead, and he told them to repent. He told them that he's the only way to God the Father, and yet people deny it and reject it anyway. Even though someone did rise from the dead and tell them, Jesus knew. He said, hey, even if someone rises from the dead, they still won't repent. These are the very words of Jesus Christ. Hell's going to be much more than a place of physical torment. It'll be mental torment as well. Those who are consigned to this place will also be in torment with the thoughts of what they could have been if only they would have trusted Jesus. How would my life have been different if I would have trusted Jesus from the beginning? I think the greatest witness anyone could ever receive is the witness from God's word. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. So that's why we need to share the word today. That's why we need to proclaim the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So much more so with the times we're living in. So people... Be a diligent and faithful servant and let somebody know about the only one who can save them. His name is Jesus. And he's coming back again sooner than most people think. I love you guys. God bless you. Good Lord willing. I'll see you again tomorrow.